everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Deadhead Cannabis Show. I'm Larry Mishkin of the Hoban Law Group. I have my usual cast of uh, cohorts with me today. Rob Hunt from California, Jim Marty from Colorado. Uh, we have a great show for everyone today. Uh, lots of good Grateful Dead stuff to talk about, including uh, the anniversary of Brent Midland's first show with the band, uh, some other music that's floating around out there that we want to touch on. And we are very hopeful that we will be joined uh, later in the show by our guest today, Mark Thomas, the owner of The Alley in Chicago, a uh, a very, very well-known head shop. Uh, and as I will joke around with him, we like to say that everyone in Chicago bought their first bong from Mark, and we are hopeful that he will be able to join us today. He's a He's a long-standing member in the cannabis industry, an original member of Normal, and uh, got some good stories to tell. But in the meantime, we've got plenty of things to talk about. Let me say hi first to my co-host, Jim Marty in Colorado. Jim, how are you doing today? Very good. Yep. Got lots of things to talk about. Wonderful, wonderful. And Rob, how are you doing out there in uh, sunny California? I'm doing great, Larry. How are you doing today? Uh, excited for another good show. Yes, yeah, yeah, so am I. There's a lot of good stuff for us to talk about today, all very exciting, and uh, looking forward to diving into it. So let's start with this, Jim. You know, for better or for worse, you're the old man in the group, so we're going to go to you first, because uh, you are the only one amongst us who can say that you bridged the gap between Keith Gauchow and uh, Brent Midland. And uh, we are coming up here uh, on the uh, anniversary, what I guess will be, I'm bad at math, so what is this, the 42nd anniversary of his first show? Yeah, 1979 to 2021 would be 42 years. Yeah, I, I saw one of the last uh, Keith and Donna shows, 115.79, and I also saw one of the first Brett Midland shows, uh, 5.12.79 at the UMass football stadium. Great show. Saw Brett many times at Red Rocks with a very good line of vision to see him uh, wail away on his uh, Hammond B3 organ. So let me ask you, even though you were basically a neophyte deadhead at that time, was there any discernible difference to you in the two shows? Well, I think I've mentioned before on previous shows, I enjoyed the January 79 show very much, uh, but I didn't really get it. I remember my now brother-in-law turned to me and said, you don't believe it, Jim. This guy next to us has been to 25 Grateful Dead shows. <laughs> we, we couldn't believe that people would do multiple shows like that or that I would end up doing that myself. Um, but the, um, the UMass show was great, uh, wonderful drum solo. We got a Terrapin. I, I, I just listened to it recently. I forgot how good sh that show was, but a great first set, Jack Straw. So uh, we had a lot of fun. Had a lot of fun at that show, and it was very memorable for me because uh, you know, I graduated from UMass a week later in that same football stadium, got my diploma, and uh, we're surrounded by all our college friends of four to five years up at UMass, and... Uh, it was kind of the last time we were all together, and uh, we all went our separate ways in, in life after the graduation. So it was a very memorable show for me. In fact, I think I sent you guys a, a picture of my now spouse and myself at that show. Okay. A young, a young Jim Marty who, who knew back then even what, what he liked music-wise. Well, the other end of the spectrum, because I, I, I'm, I'm right in the middle. I, I, I dived in in 82, and, and Brent was already the guy full-time. Uh, but Rob, you came on the scene relatively late uh, in terms of Brent's career. You still had a chance to see him for a few years, and then you transitioned us over into uh, into Vince. So you could talk to us about it from that side of the equation. So yeah, Larry, I, I, d I definitely jumped into uh, the Grateful Dead when Brent Midland was you know kind of the star of the keyboards. Um, for me, the first show was in 1988, and for me, I really knew nothing but you know the Brent Midland years uh, when I first was was listening to the Grateful Dead. You know, I listened to some 70s, but obviously like, the Brent years the ones that um, were the ones that everyone was trading tapes for among my friends. So you know, I, I always knew that organ sound better than anything else. So I was a huge fan of Brent, and uh, it was definitely one of the, the key reasons I started seeing the Dead is because I thought Brent's keyboard playing was just so amazing. You know, it was the it was the amazing keyboard playing because he he really had that talent, and that's what my, drove my wife to him. She just loved to sit there and listen to him play those little interludes where, you know, he would just drop something into the middle of the song at the right place at the right time. I liked him because I, although I I can't speak like Jim could, I had never seen the band before him, but it really seemed to me 
that along the way that he really invigorated Jerry in a way that was good for Jerry, you know, really kind of brought out a lot of energy in Jerry. I, I'll never forget when they broke out Dear Mr. Fantasy at Red Rocks, and it was, you know, basically just the two of them sitting there trying to push it through. And, you know, Jerry had a big old smile on his face, and and he and Brent were clearly enjoying themselves. And uh, and that was great to see. I think they really worked well off of one another. Uh, I think uh, Brent pushed uh, Jerry a little bit, uh, you know, to, to go into some things Jerry might not otherwise have done. And, you know, I mean, I thought overall then that Brent just added so much to the band as a a great singer as well as a a, a tremendous uh, keyboard player. Uh, Dear Mr. Fantasy, Hey Jude, reprise, correct? I believe that's correct. Yeah, and initially I think they just did it as a, independently as Dear Mr. Fantasy, and then they started entering the uh, the Hey Jude reprise back in 1988, and they started doing that for about a year and a half, two years. But there was obviously like a real connection between you know kind of those um, Spencer Davis um, and. Uh, goodness, what's his name, Steve Winwood uh, songs, because he also did the uh, the combination with Phil Lush of playing Give Me Some Lovin' as well. So, you know, there's a couple songs where they love doing the duets, one was with Jerry and one was with Phil. Yeah, and, and you know, and, and it was great. Uh, you know, it really got the sense that, you know, Brent really fit in. The band members all really seemed to like him. Um, he had a good sense of humor. If you know any of you who have ever seen that, uh, the video from the 1980 tapings in um, Radio City Music Hall, and it starts off, it's Franken and Davis, and it starts off at the very beginning. They're trying to get Brent Midland to introduce them, and he walks out, he goes, ah, I don't know these guys, I'm brand new, I don't know why they're here, but they told me I had to introduce them, and I thought, this is great. I mean, here's a guy who's really the new man in the group, and he's going out in front and, you know, poking a little fun at everybody, and everybody seemed to be okay with that. So, but I think we've also talked about, right, that it's, it's generational and kind of the grass is always greener. You know, I never saw, I, got, I never got to see Keith, so I was wondering what that was like. And, and my, my younger brothers, who, when by the time they got into it, they didn't really get to see Brent. Uh, you know, they were all seeing Vince and their friends were all seeing Vince and I would go visit them in school. And when they would hear that I saw Brent, oh my God, you got to see Brent Midland. That's so amazing. You know, and I'm sitting there thinking, yeah, kind of, I mean, it is absolutely amazing, but I mean, it's not like I saw pig pen or anything, but to them it was. And you know, that, that was, uh, that was always a very you know cool thought too. I, re I really uh, enjoyed that. And I think it's cool, Larry, that you brought up the fact that the dead did put them right, put Brent right out in front, right in the beginning. So you think a lot of bands would say, okay, let's, you know, take a little bit of time, get to feel how you're playing. But, you know, almost right away, they let him put out songs like Tons of Steel and, you know, a couple other songs uh, initially. And obviously, he got his, his heyday on, um, on the uh, Built to Last album, where I think four out of the nine tracks were Brent tracks. And so it's, uh, you know, at that point when he was doing um, Blow Away and, uh, and We Can Run and uh, I Will Take You Home, I mean, that, that album in many ways was a, was a Brent Midland album. So, uh, you know, there was a period of time there where they kind of let them kick it off and then, uh, you know, played a lot of their, their standards and went right back in and started uh, really letting Brent take the reins, which was really the tragedy of watching him pass away in 1990, is that he'd just gotten to the point where he no longer felt like the new guy and he was really actually making massive contributions to the band uh, as a lyricist and as a songwriter. It's, 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 it's an untold tragedy in the band that never received the same, you know, proper amount of attention clearly and maybe not as much as when Jerry died, but, you know, to me, I, I, I saw that as a staggering loss for the band and, and give Vince Wellnick credit for it. And we've talked about him already, you know, coming into a tight situation and, you know, really making the best of it and, and certainly filling in ably on the back end. But I agree with you, Rob. I think that uh, at that point, uh, Brent had really come into his own and, you know, they had a tremendous future uh, with him doing it. And, you know, the, the irony that unfortunately we here in Chicago all have to live with is that first Brent and then subsequently Jerry wound up playing their last shows in this city. Uh, and then they both went home and eventually died from uh, their, uh, their uh, addictions, uh, which was really, really too bad. But, you know, we, we take him for what he was. We have his music to listen to and, uh, you know, well worth taking the time today to, to note who he was and the role he played in the band. You know, what I thought was interesting on one of our previous shows when we had um, Vince, Vince Wellnick's associate on, that uh, Jerry didn't want Vince doing the Hammond B3. He, he, he wanted him to stay on that jazzy flat keyboard. I, I thought yeah. that was an interesting story. Right. The B3 died with Brent. That was the end of it for the band. And that was really, I, I love the B3 sound. And, you know, we've all talked about being there in the midst of a hot show and we're all off in another space watching that little wheel at the bottom of the column spin around like crazy. And you knew that Brent was just cranking it out. Um, and when he would get going, boy, that he, he could, he could drive up the energy in a show like nobody's business. So it is a shame. Um, you know, there's never going to be another one like him, but at least we have him around and we can talk about him all the time. 
Um, gentlemen, I would like to switch topics here very quickly because I see that our guest, Mark Thomas, has been able to join us. Uh, we are very, very excited about this. Uh, as I indicated uh, at the outset of the show, uh, Mark is a little bit of a uh, cannabis legend here in Chicago. Uh, as the owner of The Alley, uh, located right in the heart of Wrigleyville, uh, at uh, Belmont and Clark Street, just a, a hop, skip, and away, jump away from the uh, the red line at the Belmont Station right there. And you will find most guys living in the Chicago metropolitan area, which is a pretty large area, who are, you know, generally in our age group. So, you know, from Rob being the baby of the group up to Jim being the, the senior leader. Uh, if you reach out to those people who all smoke marijuana and you ask them where they bought their first bong or their first piece of paraphernalia, 95% of them are going to tell you the alley. And they might even tell you the alley even if they didn't buy it from there because they wished they would have bought it from there. That's the kind of power that this place has had in Chicago. When I moved here in the early 1980s, um, I had heard of it and I would go buy it from time to time. But yet here we are, you know, almost 40, 50 years later and people still talk about it. Uh, you know, fathers bring their kids there. And, uh, you know, if you're going to go to a game at Wrigley Field, it's a nice a side trip to run over to the alley really fast and take a look in. And Mark Thomas is the guy behind all of it. And he has joined us today. Uh, so, Mark, first of all, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to our show. Thanks. I apologize. I'm running a little crazy here, a little late. Thank you. And, um, you know, and the alley was at Belmont and Clark for 40 years, but now we're at Belmont in California. We're over in Avondale. So we are in a another reinvention of our life and, and still kicking hard. Here's my question for you. How old does it make you feel when these guys who are 50 and 60 are walking up to you and saying, hey, man, I bought my first bong from you? Wonderful feeling in the world when those guys in their 60s bring their 42-year-old daughter and their 17-year-old grandchild in. And I have three <laughs> generations shopping in the alley, and the guy sitting there going, yeah, do you remember me? I, you know, I bought that big, huge bong, and then I walked out, and it broke, and then I came back, and you gave me another one for half off. And I go, yeah, I remember you. And so it's, you know what, it's it's why I've come back, and that's why I'm, I'm back here in business we're having a ball, um, you know, and, and, and it's, it's, it's how the world has turned over. You know, we got chased out of the bond business. I mean, you know, I was, uh, you know, we were huge. And, and then suddenly the feds were chasing us all. And gosh, I was with a guy last night for dinner who spent three years with a bracelet on his uh, foot. And he could go to work every morning from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And they took three semis out of his warehouse. And uh, how ridiculous that all looks today. Mm. Well, that that raises a good point, Mark. I mean, as a guy who's really been involved in the industry, you know, for as long as as you have, you know, what are the biggest? I mean, I, I know that obviously in Illinois now we've gone legal, but just in terms of the culture and the people and everything, where do what do you see as being some of the significant changes over the last forty or so years? I guess we don't have to be paranoid anymore. You know, kind of, you know, it's kind of been the paranoia has been lifted off of our, our shoulders and, and we're no longer paranoid. Uh, you know, one of my best friends used to have his little pipe and his little vial with his uh, pot in it, in his back pocket, and he had it in a handkerchief. So if he saw the police coming, he would yank the bag back of the handkerchief and the pipe and the little vial with uh, his weed would just fall on the grass and he'd walk away and it wasn't his. So, you know, it's so nice not to have to think about paranoia. It's it's so nice to, you know, come out of the weeds and, and, and be part of the real world. And, you know, it's, you know, nobody's got the statistics yet, but, you know, what percentage of the American population has used or is current using, uh, it's, it's astronomical. I mean, you know, the liquor industry didn't want pot to be legal. Uh, you know, the offices of Normal, the, the guy who was the executive director of Normal in the uh, early 80s was working part-time for me in the store for minimum wage for four and a half dollars an hour. And then he had a, a free office in my building. I mean, Normal didn't have a dollar to rub together. Um, you know, we were running full page ads in high times and... You know, it was uh, it was an incredible time, and 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 it's a shame that we spent 40 years, and I can't tell you how many of my friends have gone to jail for selling bongs. Mark, Jim Marty here. 
uh, one of the one of the hosts. Um, what year did you open, and when did you? What was your first encounter with uh, law enforcement for having a head shop? Well, I took over the alley in 1976 as a young punk kid. Um, and we were making roach clips. I, I was on the way to Harvard for a law degree, and my parents got into a fight. Nobody paid my tuition at Latin. And so I went out and bought a bale of wire and started making roach clips in the basement of a high rise next to the John Hancock building and, you know, and, and driving around selling roach clips to head shops. And I'll never forget the first time my trunk got popped open by a cop, and there's these bags of roach clips and, and everything else there. So. I mean, you know, it's 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 been a long, strange trip, as, as the music would say. Um, so, you know, it was '76. That, that's that was kind of when it all happened, and and I didn't open the alley, uh, didn't get to go to Harvard, got thrown out of Latin, and started making roach clips. And the next thing I know, that there was an older guy that, that owned a store in Woodfield Mall, and he thought he was going to open up alleys all over the world. He was a very famous rich guy in Chicago. And the whole thing was failing for him because they were ripping him off. And so, you know, this undercover boss, so, you know, he ended up owing me 20 grand, and he wasn't paying me. And I went in there to bring his neck. And in about 10 minutes, he propositioned me, why don't you go undercover there, see if you can figure this out, and let's be partners. And so I wasn't even legally able to sign a document and become a partner. I had a, a partner in my business who, you know, basically stood in front and took the contract for a while. And, uh, you know, and, and, and so there was a guy by the name of Captain Alley, who was the captain of the Schomburg Police Department. And he, and he came walking into the store and he goes, I hear you're the new guy here. And what are we going to do about cleaning this crap out of this mall? And you know how many complaints we get about this? And um, yeah, it's, quite, it's, it's been quite an experience. I've had my house raided and they found nothing at the time. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's just, you know, living without paranoia. Just think about living without paranoia. Well, I'm so interested in the, the history of all this. What was the legal uh, context that people would go to jail for selling bongs? Well, so, you know, from about 1975 until early, you know, I don't know, when, when, when did Reagan get into office? 1980. Okay. That's when the trouble started. So from 75 to 1980, it was a heyday. We were making money so quick. You know, the, unfortunately, some of the guys that owned the dispensaries, they still can't figure out how to deposit their cash. I mean, we had bags of cash. And it was just an incredible world. And then suddenly Reagan got into office, and the Fed started looking, going, what is this crap? You know, these are illegal drugs, and you're selling illegal drug equipment. And they started you know, building laws and state, cities and states, you know, they, they were mad at the head shops. They, you know, they, we, we, we represented, um, much like it is today, you know, it was kind of a social justice, rub your nose in it. You know, this is what the real world looks like. Who are you guys? And, um, and they came after us and, and, and um, they forced a lot of people out of business. I had a lot of friends that got arrested. I mean, God, the guy that I was with last night, he lost $2 million in inventory. It took him three days and three semis to clean his warehouse out. And then, like I said, he wore a, a, he wore a bracelet on his ankle for three years. So, so Mark, uh, Rob Hunt speaking, another one of the co-hosts. Uh, I had a lot of friends that got wrapped up in Operation Pipe Dreams, which obviously I'm sure you're very familiar with. You know, I, sure. I three, or, three or four of my buddies that went to jail during that period. Um, you know, my, my buddy uh, um, Jason Harris went to jail, who's you know drawing Baker Designs. I'm sure you carry his products in your store. And my buddy Shay from Seedless got popped as well, who owns Zong Toy Company. Uh, Tommy Chong went down in that one as well, which thank goodness he did, because it gave us the Wolf of, uh, of Wall Street as a result. Uh, so, you know. 
It's a, a, a good story coming out of a bad one. But that was, you know, look, I, I owned um, a series of, of hydroponics gardening supply stores and all the same issues that you went through uh, owning head shops, I went through from that sort of plausible deniability standpoint of, you know, you wouldn't be able to call things, you know, bongs in your shop. You had to call them water pipes. And, you know, I couldn't say that we were selling for cannabis cultivation at the time. We were selling for tomatoes and peppers. It was all a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. You know, you got to know the vernacular and you have to speak a certain way because, you know, you don't know who's uh, on the other side of the counter from you and it could be a fed just as easily as it could be a customer. So, you know, how did you navigate those issues and where did you draw the line? Because I know that like I was when, when Colorado legalized cannabis, largely legalized, I, I moved my entire um, uh, disposition away from plausible deniability to affirmative defense of, yeah, I'm selling to weed growers, you know, come get me because my states as I can. When did you make the determination where you said, I'm no longer putting up with this nonsense and how did you handle it before that? Well, I mean, you know, honestly, you know, we started our own trade association. I was part, I was on the board of the National PTA, the Paraphernalia Trade Association. We thought that was really cute at the time. Um, it, I, I think that that might have drawn, uh, you know, more heat. And so, you know, we, we hired some really good lawyers. You know, I took my bongs and I went to, you know, the, I went downstairs. We were manufacturing by this time tens of thousands of items. And I looked at my guy and I said, I want you to make a bong bowl that holds a cigarette. And so what we started to do is we started to, you know, so this was a law that was built on intent. And so what we had to do is we had to flip the intent. And we had signs up in the store that sell, we sell tobacco products. And if you come in here and you ask for drug paraphernalia, we're gonna have to ask you to leave the store. And so we had to train our customers and our customers would come in and you didn't ask for a bong any right anymore. You asked for a cigarette cooler, you know, and we sold, <laughs> you know, and we, and we sold herbal smoking substances that didn't get you high. We got a tobacco license. And so um, I just found the brochure because, you know, it was like we had not, not only have to retrain my staff, I had to retrain the consumer who was walking in that store. Um, and, and then, you know, come 1982, now the feds came after us with a federal law. And, um, and, and I decided I just wasn't going to fight the federal government that I just, you know, couldn't see going to jail. Um, we had slipped into this punk world lifestyle. So the shop was kind of half pipes and half punk. And so I sold off all my manufacturing equipment, my trademarks, my patents, and we converted the alley into this lifestyle store. And by the way, later on, we got into the cigar business. We went to, I went to Nicaragua, I made my own cigars. Uh, you know, we have, we built brands, we built a sex store, we built a jewelry store. I mean, you know, and, and so it, it just forced us to be creative and, and change what we were doing. And I mean, it's amazing to walk into a head shop, you know, in, in the old days, you know, I walked, I walked into a store in Tucson last week, I'm at the Gem and Mineral Show, buying jewelry for, you know, the store and buying stones and everything else. A head shop today looks nothing like what we looked like 40 years ago. There is no acrylic bongs. There's like 10 or 15 little wooden pipes. There's three or four dugouts. And then the whole wall is full of two and three hundred dollar pieces of art blown out of glass. And back in the day, I used to hate selling glass bongs because the kids who worked for me might have been a little stoned and they kept breaking the glass bongs. And, you know, I look at these two hundred and five hundred and twelve hundred and gosh, there was a place in L.A. that I was in a few years ago. And I mean, every pipe in the place was a thousand to five thousand dollars. They were works of incredible art. Um, and, and it was just amazing to see the, the work that these guys did. Mark, let me ask you this. Look, let's look at the other side of the equation because back in the late seventies, early eighties, you know, and, and especially as you say, after the Reagan era kicked in, uh, when, when the, it kind of became a pox on all things drug related, who were the guys that were manufacturing all these glass pieces that you were selling in your store? You know, how did you know how to find them and how did they successfully produce without running afoul of the law? Oh, so this, this this is the story of all stories. 
So the New York Boutique Show, which was kind of a hippy-dippy show, the paraphernalia industry took over the whole show. We were 30-40% of the exhibitors. It started off in the McAlpern Hotel, and so the top floors were all the head shop people, and you'd take an elevator to the 10th floor, and, and you got out of the elevator, and you were stoned 30 seconds later from the smoke, and you'd walk around that floor, and then you walk to the staircase, and you walk around the next floor, and the first four or five floors were all head shop people, and then, you know, it was t-shirts, and, you know, all kinds of stuff as you got further down in the hall, and then, then we got over, we went from the McAlpern Hotel over to the Jacob Javits Center, and we literally, there was a thousand booths by then, and Maybe 800 of them were clothing, but the head shop guys were all up in front. And we were the driving force that made that whole fashion world go at that point. We drew in all of these people because the head shop people were really, they had a lot of ingenuity. So it wasn't just a pipe. It was clothing. It was dead stuff. It was rock and roll. It was so it was so many lifestyles that came into this. And it was just incredible. And, and um, you know, I, I was running full page ads in High Times Magazine. And, and we weren't just doing, you know, cannabis stuff. We were doing other stuff. And, and, and High Times used to send their limo for the full page advertisers to pick you up when you landed. And, and they had a guy who was the limo driver who was the spinning image of Jerry Garcia. <laughs> Maybe it was and you get into this you know, this crazy limo and you'd flip over where the liquor was and there was like compartments full of all of the pot and the hash and everything else that were the centerfolds of High Time Magazine. Oh my God. And, and I mean, it was crazy and, and it was so wide open until the, you know, the Reagan era and then they came after us and, and, uh, and, and I mean, gosh, I mean, as late as, 10 or 12 years ago, there was a guy out in Northwest Indiana and he got so big and so slick and he thought he was smart. And so all of his money got picked up COD by UPS. And then instead of the money going to his account, he had it deposited offshore in, in one of the, his Bahamas accounts. And when the feds came in, I mean, he was living in a mansion with a a pond in the front. They brought scuba divers and they were diving to the bottom of the pond. They thought there was a vault in the bottom of the pond. And, and I mean, you know, it was just absolute insanity. Um, and honestly, I, I moved on. I just, I, I you know, I, I, I couldn't, you know, we thought, you know, R.J. Reynolds and all the cigarette people had trademarks in the late 70s. Lid, you know, nickel bag. They were ready for legalization. The liquor industry was our enemy. The liquor industry never wanted pot to be legal because it was easier, cheaper, and certainly you get a lot less damage. You know, a guy that smokes a couple, two, three joints a day is a lot less damage than a guy who's smoking two or three six or drinking two or three six packs a day or drinking a quart of vodka a day. I mean, you know, it was it was, and so it, the liquor industry was our was our enemy. And the liquor industry pushed the feds, and the feds went for it. And, you know, you had Reagan in office, and, you know, there's not much more to say. So, so what was that like in Chicago? Because I always think of Chicago as being such a, um, an alcohol-driven town, you know, from the days of Prohibition all the way through... Uh, you know, the, the relaxed rules about how late bars could stay open and, you know, just the fact that that whole town is kind of driven by alcohol consumption. I got to think for you to be a counterculture figure in the 70s and 80s, kind of bucking the alcohol system was probably a double whammy based on your location. You know, it was big alcohol. So, you know, everybody knew that people were out back smoking a joint behind the bars and, you know, and then walking back in and having a cocktail. I mean, my God. My first job, my, my, my one and only job was, was working in Piper's Alley in Old Town, and we used to hide in this little gangway between the, where I think it's the Walgreens now and the building next door. And eventually, you know, Belushi and Aykroyd took this building at the end of that little gangway and turned it into the Blues Brothers bar. It was like a private bar for all the guys. And we used to sit in that little gangway. We'd be smoking a joint, and Belushi'd walk up, and he'd grab it out of your hand and go... <laughs> 
can't pick you, bench man, and, he, and he'd walk away. I think you have to let him know that you, you had good proximity to Second City, right? Well, we did, and, and, and so, you know, Second City, you know, I mean, listen, the culture that we are today existed in the 60s and the 70s. And, and it was crushed by the liquor industry and, and, and everybody else. And, and the tobacco industry got really unhappy with us. So, you know, I got into the cigar business. I, I went to Nicaragua. We made cigars. I had some of the finest cigars in the world. And, you know, if you happen to carry an unusual shaped wooden pipe in your fine cigar store, you know, there were fine cigar manufacturers that would walk in and they'd look and if they saw a left-handed pipe, as we called it, <laughs> they'd pull your line. They, they didn't want the association with marijuana. And suddenly you couldn't get a hot selling cigar line. So, you know, you, you know, back then I had to make a choice. And you know what? I've had a wonderful life. And when people write me emails and texts and they say, you know, there were a lot of people who thought I was a weirdo. And there were a lot of people who didn't accept my lifestyle. And I want you to know that when we went into your stores, we felt safe. We felt accepted. And every time I get something like that, it practically brings tears to my eyes. Because that's what we were all about. And, and, and you see what's going on with social justice in our world today. And, you know, tomorrow... We're co-sponsoring a transgender fashion show in Water Tower. And we were hiring transgender people 40 years ago before people even understood. In fact, I had to have a guy hauled out in handcuffs because he walked in and he saw our first transgender employee. And he goes, what are you doing with that freak work we're working in the store? And, you know, I had to put a bullet in your head. What is the matter with you? And, you know, he had his cowboy boots on and he was up from I don't know where. And I had an off-duty cop with me. And, and he looks, he goes, what did you say to Mr. Thomas? And he says, I said, I ought to put a bullet in his head for hiring that freak. And he got taken out of there in handcuffs that day. Um, so the alley was a safe place. The alley was a place of acceptance. Um, and society could have learned from the alley from 30, 40 years ago, and we'd be a different place today. But we accepted everybody. You know, I, I, we accepted everybody. Everybody was welcome as long as you were kind. You mentioned uh, Belushi and the Blues Brothers. What other musical connections did the alley have? Uh, you know, not... Not a big connection. You know what I mean? It was, you know, back then I didn't even own the alley yet. I was just a kid on the street hustling roach clips up and down. You know, Wall Street was the Greenwich Village of Chicago. And then when I took over the alley in Woodfield, because the guy owed me 20 grand, and eventually I took the store over. It was what you now call a debt for equity swap. Back then it was like, you know, I'm going to take your business over or or you got to give me 20 grand in cash and he couldn't figure out how to run it. And he said, go, do whatever you got to do. And, and, and we ended up splitting and being, you know, God, I was a 20 year old kid. And he and I split a half a million dollars the first year I ran that store and that partnership with him. Now, Mark, though, you did, you did have some promotional tie-ins with rock musicians from time to time, didn't you? People who would want to come into the alley and, and, uh, and, and get a little publicity. Everybody. I mean, whether it was Rob Zombie or Plant and Page or, you know, I mean, when the dead were there, the whole road crew was in the store. You know, I mean, Bono was in the store. I mean, you know, uh, you know, we have a building today with 110 music and art studios. Forty years ago, Al Jorgensen from Ministry was in our building on Lake Street. When he came through here a year ago and he was doing his book signing tour, he called me up and he said, can you help promote my book signing tour? I mean, the guy used to be my tenant 40 years ago. So, yes, the, the rock industry. And then, you know, we did licensing and we, we did stuff for the Rolling Stones and the Beatles. And we made belt buckles and we made incense burners and we made wall plaques. And, and, and you know, the Misfits, Jerry only from the Misfits used to do in stores. We would have people lined up from the front door of the alley all the way down the block, through Dunkin' Donuts, on to Belmont, hundreds of people waiting in line to meet the guy and get an autograph. It's amazing. I mean, these are, you know, these are great stories, great memories. And the best part about it is, is you're a survivor, and here you are on the other end of it, 
you know, and you can tell all those stories. And, and there's a lot of people today, you know, who've, who've grown up in this much more permissive society, and especially where we're at now, who just can't really get their heads around, you know, the, the, the types of situations you used to face back then just trying to participate in this industry. Yeah, there was a, a record straw called Flipside, and they were, they were the test case, and it practically bankrupted me. You know, the guy that owned Adam's Apple and Job Papers and I and a couple other people. And I threw so much money into the kitty. We took that case all the way to the Supreme Court and got our asses kicked. And um, and, and it was, you know, a bad lawyer and, and, and he didn't understand intent. So, you know, it was it was, you know, it was quite. Listen, it's been a quite, you know, for a kid that could have gone to Harvard. I was at Latin school. Nobody paid the tuition. I started making roach clips. I've traveled four million miles all over the world. I've had a life of just incredible experiences. Now, have you had any of the uh, current um, uh, license holders in Illinois or other places, you know, seek you out for uh, licensing opportunities or to to get to kind of you know jump onto the alley name and the recognition factor with it? Well, you know what? Actually, we've just been doing trademark work, trying to protect tobacco stuff. Uh, for the alleys names and for some of our sub brands in preparation for that and you know listen at a certain point cannabis is going to become like bread butter and milk and there's going to be more product than there is demand and so at that point and 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 probably earlier on for some of the small boutique growers that are coming in they need a brand they need somebody they can believe in and, and so I, I think that the alley is somebody people can believe in and they can be comfortable and they remember these good times. And, and so, um, you know, we're, we're working really hard towards licensing and, and getting prepared for that. Absolutely. What are you selling right now the most of? You know, are you selling like a lot of Grav, a lot of Roar? Like what, which products are, uh, are, are hitting for you? No, number one item in the store is leather motorcycle jackets, leather vests. Number two item in the store are the craziest, funkiest platform shoes you've ever seen in your life. And, you know, um, so, you know, it, listen, it, it was goth. It was this. Today, it's just streetwear. And uh, shoes and leathers is where the money is. It's, it's, it's bigger dollar items. We move tons of it. And, uh, you know, by the way, I had 20, 30 competitors in a three block area 30 years ago today i'm the last guy in four or five hundred miles where you can walk in and buy this crazy pair of boots and you know buy i mean the selection of leather i mean just came from tucson I, you know i bought fifteen thousand. i bought back just bags of silver jewelry where can you walk in and buy the stuff we sell anymore i'm the last man standing so you're the you're the king of counterculture in the city of chicago you know, and and we are the, the, the king of acceptance and, 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 you know, we all need to learn from the experiences of the alley that, you know, we, we need to accept each other and we need to be safe. And, and you know what? And, and it's, you know, listen, I learned in therapy 30 years ago, good and bad were not good terms because there was a winner and a loser. Different was a term. I'm not good. I'm not bad. I'm different. Indifference a big deal. Mark, you said um, that you had one of the, the founders of Normal Working View. Was that Keith Strupp? Because I know he was at um, Chicago Urbana for, or Illinois Urbana for school. Was that the person that was uh, working in your shop for a while? Or who did you have from, you know, that was the executive director of Normal? Yeah, I can't remember the kid. He was in law school here. He was in um, John Marshall. And I, I, I ended up buying his roll top desk from him. He needed money to eat. And I bought his roll top desk. Don't remember him. I got a picture of him in a photo album somewhere. And uh, it was crazy. You know, I mean, they, they, they couldn't even afford an office in Chicago. They weren't paying him. He was a volunteer executive director for Normal in Chicago. And I don't, you know, I guess you guys would know better than I. I don't know. Larry, is, is Normal a, a well-funded active organization today? Sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they've got offices all over the place. We still have active offices in Chicago, Illinois, 
uh, but uh, they're they're still a, a very strong force nationally. Uh, they have a uh, an annual uh, legal conference in Aspen, Colorado, that I had gone to for a number of years uh, until the last couple with uh, the pandemic and everything. But yeah, they're still out there and uh, they're still trying to fight the fight. Yeah, I mean, you know, and 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 we believed, you know, and and we weren't wrong, we were right, you know. The, but you know, it it got to the point where, gosh. There was a guy by the name of Marty Millman. He owned a company in Philadelphia, MSA. His older parents had lent him money to open up, and they were shareholders with him. And when the feds came in, they looked at him and they said, you can plead guilty to this, or we're going to put your 75-year-old parents in jail for the balance of their life. OK? And so they, they brutalized this guy. I mean, what are you going to do? Send your parents to jail? So he signed, he signed a consent degree. They took all of his merchandise. He changed his business. They, they, they put him in jail for, I don't know, two and a half, three years, but they let him out every day again at 6 a.m. And he drove to work and he had to be back at 6 p.m. And, you know, he didn't have any options. He, you know, he had to save his parents' life. They, they weren't going to make it in jail. And so he went to jail every day and slept, and he came back and ran the business. And, you know, a lot of us got out of the pipe business, the guy I was with last night. You know, he became one of the top five guys in America when it came to, you know, Fifty Shades of Grey merchandise. And, and, and you know, and, and, you know and, and just like we were trying to enlighten people with marijuana, you know, then then we started to enlighten people with sexuality, and 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 you know, it was okay. Sex was no, you know, sex was never a four-letter word. Neither was pot, but they certainly treated pot and sex like they were four-letter words back in the Reagan era. Yeah, yeah. Mark, um, your stories are fascinating, and uh, we could certainly talk with you all day. Uh, we are, however, uh, I think, getting close to the end of our time. So, what I'd like to do before we have to log off is uh, how can our listeners get in touch with you? Uh, how can they find out about what's going on with the alley, um, you know, and, and find out about these things that you're talking about? Do you have a, a current website or what's the best way for people to learn about the alley? So, so you know, the, the, the website is thealleychicago.com. On Facebook and Instagram, it's The Alley Chicago. And, uh, you know, if you want to, interact with me, you send an email to daboss, D-A-B-O-S-S, at thealley.com. Um, that comes directly to me. And, you know, honestly, I answer the phone for the website. We, we do, I do customer service. I'm in the store. I love what I do. I love my customers. And I love the culture that we've created. And I love the culture that all of you are creating. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Mark. Uh, it's, it's been a real treat to have you and to get to hear some of your stories. And, you know, we always like to hear a little bit about the old guard so we can appreciate everything that we have today. Um, so thank you so much. If you will, uh, if you could just hang on for one more second while we wrap up the show, and uh, we'd certainly love to come back and chat to you, uh, with you for a few minutes afterwards. Um, so thank you. Uh, Rob and Jim, uh, we may have a some quick time here just to touch on anything else, uh, dead or marijuana or otherwise that you guys have any interest in talking about today? Anything out there? Well, I want to say thank you to, to Mark Thomas. And, uh, I don't know what else I could add to that. That was absolutely fascinating. Oh, good. Glad. Yeah. I like those stories. Um, I will just say that since we have been following, uh, uh Europe 72, uh, things pick back up again tonight with, uh, actually one of my favorite uh, shows from the entire tour it was a, uh, a one set show that they did at the Beat Club in, in Bremen, West Germany, which I guess is kind of West Germany's version of rock and roll television. And they went to the TV studio and they and they played this set. So it was maybe almost like an off night for them. Uh, but it's fantastic. It's got a 20 minute plane in the band sandwiched around to Mr. Charlie Sugary and one more Saturday night that just is you have to hear it to believe it. Um, so even on a night when they weren't out in front of a live audience, they were just rocking and rolling on that tour. Um, and, you know, the exciting part is, you know, this is only about the seventh show of the whole tour. So we still have lots of good stuff to go. Uh, very excited about that. Um, we still have to one of these days talk about the 50th anniversary of Skull and Roses, but we'll leave that for a day when we have enough time to do it. 
What about you, Rob? Anything else? I mean, we're, we're, we're overlooking the, uh, the obvious one, Larry, which is that we have not talked about Happy 420 a single time on this episode. How do we go through a Deadhead Cannabis show that we're taping the day after 420 and not say Happy 420 to all of our listeners out there? Um, you know, obviously, I think uh, at this point, 420 is just kind of just a common holiday, but from a counterculture perspective and going back to kind of all the things that Mark did, you know, this is, I think, probably the 27th 420 that I've, that I've celebrated, you know, all the way back from the mid-90s, back, you know, when no one actually knew what 420 was, and then if you actually go all the way back in the history, back to the mid-70s when the, uh, when the Waldos were first coining the, the phrase in, in Sam Rafael, um, you know, what, a, what an amazing thing that, you know, four guys that all went to high school together have created something that worldwide now is known as a, as a holiday for, for pot smokers around the world. So to all of you guys out there, uh, I hope everyone had a really, really happy 420. And, you know, as Jim would point out in just a second, uh, we saw record sales again for another year uh, on the 420 holiday. And I think we'll continue to see this to be the, uh, the biggest day of, of cannabis smoking worldwide uh, for, for years to come. So thank you to the Waldos for, for creating something uh, as amazing as 420 is. Yes, I guess yesterday's one-day sales were $173 million, or maybe that was for the week leading up to it, but that was Colorado, California, Nevada and Washington, I believe, maybe Oregon too. You know, it, it really is unbelievable, and I'm I'm going to just fess up and admit to being an old guy. So I go to the dispensary, you know, the day before, or two days before, when they've already got the 420 sales going on. But you beat the crowd, you get in, you get out, and then on 420, I you know, I can just do my thing without you know without fighting the crowds down at the dispensaries. But yeah, it, it is a lot of fun, and it's uh, you know, it, 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 we're now at the point, Rob. You know, you said 27 years. Well, you know, my oldest is 29, my youngest is 19. They fall right in the middle of all of this, and uh, you know, so now even in my house, it's become an event, and uh, you know, it's just interesting to see. I think it's one more example of what everybody called the counterculture back in the day. But it must not be too counter because even though our parents weren't necessarily into it, our kids sure as heck are into it. And, uh, you know, maybe we did something right along the way or, you know, maybe as Mark was telling us, it's just, you know, the right vibe and you treat people nicely and with respect and, you know, that that's something that really resonates with people. But either way, 420 is a great way to do it and to bring it out. And I'm glad you mentioned that before we signed off. And th- maybe we should thank uh, law enforcement for the term 420. No, and it, it actually came from the Waldos, not from law enforcement. It's a misnomer, Mark. Really? I thought well, I thought that was... That no, was... the 420 in progress is a myth. Uh, the, the, the people that actually came up with 420, if you look it up, the 420 Waldos, and I've actually had the unique experience of being taken to their vault uh, in San Francisco below Bank of America, in the Bank of America vault, to see all the original materials they had that they used to send back and forth to each other um, back in like the late 70s, talking about, you know, 420, like the whole thing was meeting at 420 after school and after sports, that they went to go search for a, uh, a pot field that was out by the Coast Guard station on Point Reyes that they would go look for it together, and they called that, you know, like, we'll meet at 420, it just became, hey, let's 420, let's go 420, and then they started using it as an excuse to, to call anything pot-related 420, and even as they got to college, they'd still write each other letters that would, uh, you know, use the 420 moniker, and they backed it up, you know, the, the story's been told many times, but I've actually seen it in person, all the information they have related to it, that they've kept in a vault, that they figured would be worth something one day as this thing took off. But look up the 420 Waldos. They are, uh, it is a real thing, and they are absolutely hilarious. These guys are clowns, and they're so much fun to hang out with. Good group to, good group to coin the phrase. One last thing. Uh, just back to the um, Europe 72 tour, the radio station. The story I read about that was that was a super station. It, like, had giant... Uh, broadcasting ability and when they did that show it was played all over Europe and it could be heard as far away as London yeah absolutely and I think that's an accurate story and uh, right I mean, look the whole tour was so instrumental to their being introduced all over the place but yes you're absolutely right it was a uh, it was a station that I, I guess you know might be similar to Dick Clark you know here or something where people all throughout the continent watched it to uh, get exposure, whatever the current rock and roll stuff was. So they look hats off to Sam Cutler, right? He was smart enough to know where to take the boys on an off day and still get them lots of good exposure. And, you know, they got another whole disc out of it. So, you know, it worked out well for them. I think we should sign off. I do too. Quite a show today, guys. This was really, really fantastic. Uh, once again, our guest was Mark Thomas of the alley in Chicago. Uh, we thank him very much for taking the time to be with us and to share those great stories. Uh, Jim, what do you have to say to the crowd as we leave? Happy 421. Yeah, happy 420 to everyone out there, and uh, happy uh, beginning of Brent Midland era, uh, Grateful Dead, and 
until next week, we've got lots of exciting stuff to uh, to discuss again. Yep. Next week, uh, we we are, are going to re- have a really special show. We're bringing on as our guest. Uh, a, a colleague of mine from the Hoban Law Group, an attorney named Noah Potter, who's now based in the New York area. And what's interesting is uh, marijuana was too mainstream for Noah, so he's now a legal force behind the whole uh, psychedelics and psilocybin movement. And as he and I were talking about him coming onto the show, we kind of chuckled at the fact that, you know, psilocybin and all of this is, you know, where cannabis was years and years ago, you know, just beginning to scratch the surface of it. Uh, but but uh, Noah has some really great insight to it, and uh, we'll have some interesting things to tell us about where things stand legally speaking on that. Uh, as always, there will be lots of uh, more good dead stories and maybe fish and other things that we didn't talk about this week. Uh, so for everyone out there, and on behalf of my co-hosts Jim and Rob and our guest Mark Thomas, this is Larry Mishkin. Thank you all for listening. Have a good week. Stay safe and healthy, and enjoy your cannabis responsibly. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.